Hi, and welcome to this episode of VCU Voices. I'm Jay Davenport, Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations. And today I have two special guests with us, Dr. Frank Gupton and Dr. Eric Edwards. Dr. Frank Gupton is an internationally recognized scholar and pharmaceutical industry expert. After attending the University of Richmond on a basketball scholarship, he received his master's degree from Georgia Tech. He earned his doctorate in chemistry at Virginia Commonwealth University. He had a 31-year industry career, and in 2007, Dr. Gupton retired as executive director of process development in the pharmaceuticals division where he was working. In 2016, Dr. Gupton joined the VCU School of Engineering, and he now focuses on improving global healthcare by making pharmaceutical production cleaner and more cost-effective. To help advance these goals, he founded Medicines for All Institute with a simple idea, expand, expand global access to life-saving medicines by producing them more efficiently. Dr. Eric Edwards is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Flow Corporation, a pioneering public benefit pharmaceutical corporation. As CEO, Dr. Edwards has assembled a world-class team committed to providing a solution to the broken essential medicine supply chain and end an over-reliance on foreign manufacturing of our nation's highest priority medicines. Dr. Edwards co-founded Kaleo, a pharmaceutical company here in Richmond, Virginia. During his six years, 16 years there, he held several executive management positions, including chief science officer responsible for overall scientific strategy and all pharmaceutical development programs. Dr. Edwards obtained his BS in biology from Virginia Commonwealth University, along with a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences and his doctor in medicine from Virginia Commonwealth University as well. Dr. Gupton, Dr. Edwards, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jay, for the opportunity to talk to the audience. Pleasure. Looking forward to well, the conversation. You two, you two have quite the reputation here in Richmond and across the country as being uh, absolute innovators uh, for the country and what we're trying to do internationally with the global uh, supply chain and ph pharmaceuticals. But I'd really like to know how you all got to this point in your careers. I think people have a good understanding of where you've been recently and what you're doing today. But how did you get to this point? And tell us a little bit about your background. Dr. Gupton, I'm going to start with you. So, uh, Jay, when I retired from the pharmaceutical industry in 2007, I was happily retired. I, I had spent the first six months uh, working on my honeydew list, catching up on my golf game and fishing and playing with the grandkids. And to this day, I, I contend that my wife called VCU and said, get him out of the house. So uh, I, I uh, was very fortunate in being able to receive a joint appointment between the chemistry department and the chemical engineering department. And with the idea of building a bridge between those two disciplines within the university. And I'd been there maybe about six months and the dean of the engineering school approached me and said, you know, you've managed large research groups before. Would you be willing to serve as our interim department chair? So I was the interim, I, I, I uh, declined several times and finally he twisted my arm and made an offer I couldn't refuse. And I was the interim department chair for five years. And then um, when Dean Boyne came, uh, she said, we need to change that uh, title. And I said, great, we can drop the chair title. And she said, no, I've got a better idea. I said, why don't we make it drop the interim title and you become the permanent department chair. So um, we did that and I've been the permanent department chair for the last seven years. So um, that's how I got here. But I think the interesting thing about what we're doing, uh, Eric and I are doing together, is about fixing a broken healthcare system mm -hmm. and increasing access to, to, to drug, uh, medications that everyone needs. And I started out in the global sector working with the Gates Foundation. One of the last things I did was to develop a process uh, when I was in industry, was to develop a process for an HIV drug. It turned out to be a, a, a widely prescribed HIV drug and all the combination drug therapies uh, across uh, you know, the, the globe. And so the Gates Foundation asked me to go back and look at what we could do to improve the process, you know, having some intimate knowledge about uh, the chemistry. And we were able to reduce, significantly reduce the cost of that drug uh, by about 40%. And uh, they gave us $5 million to do it. 
and the payback period on the $5 million was less than a year. Wow. So they continue to give us more uh, uh, drug targets to work on. And uh, we were able to do that on several of these drugs. And so then they asked us to expand into malaria and tuberculosis drugs. And I said, I, you know, I, I, there's just one of me, we can't do that. And they said, well, what if we gave you enough funds to be able to build an institute at the ECU to do this? And that's how it all came about. Then we started applying that same principle to drugs that were in short supply in the United States. And Eric and I had been talking about that for quite a while. And so when the opportunity presented itself as a result of you know, the COVID pandemic, we started to put the pieces of the puzzle together to, to be able to address that issue. So Dr. Edwards, why don't you share with us how you got to this point? Uh, what was your journey to this point in time? Well, uh, starting with, fortunately, to date, I have not failed miserably at retirement, um, but uh, I look forward to it one day. Um, you know, they say that necessity is the mother of invention, Jay, and that's how I got into the pharmaceutical industry. My, my identical twin brother and I grew up with life-threatening food allergies. We had to carry a potentially life-saving dose of epinephrine with us at all times. Uh, we entered college with an idea um, that there could be a better way to deliver epinephrine uh, to compete against the EpiPen. Uh, my twin brother went into engineering. I had a down a pathway through the guaranteed admission program at, at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, so I always wanted to be an emergency physician. And, and so started heading down that pathway. And, and then we decided to try to do something about this problem we had uh, that involved uh, uh, anaphylaxis and the potential for, for dying from peanuts, tree nuts, seafood, many, many other allergens. Um, and that led us to uh, go down the invention process. Uh, we had no clue what we we're getting ourselves into. This is in college. Uh, if, if someone would have told us, we would have definitely not have gotten into the pharma industry. Uh, but we worked uh, from the ground up to, to build an extraordinary team. We had great people get around us. Uh, so we started our first company in college. Um, that led to me getting into medical school as we were building the company, uh, taking some time off. So uh, I took a year off between first and second year of medical school. I took a year off before starting medical school year and then uh, b b before starting my first uh, year of medical school. And then um, uh, took four and a half years to do the PhD in between, all while building the first company, Kaleo, with a singular focus of uh, building novel technologies and, and platforms to help uh, deliver medicines better at the point of care for patients, uh, starting with uh, the epinephrine auto injector we invented uh, called AviQ. Um, did not know it was going to be regulated as a drug, did not know that the EpiPen had never gone through a single human clinical trial. So we had to fill in all of those gaps. And then we had to, you know, raise well over $150 million to get us there. Um, and uh, we just went through the process of ultimately building the right team, having the right executives and the right board and, and folks who could lead us um, in building the first company. Learned a ton along the way uh, around just how broken the pharmaceutical industry is, uh, especially the complexities around pricing and reimbursement and distribution. So I, I got to see not only the development side, but also lead the clinical programs um, and then lead innovation and help support us uh, launching the product into the marketplace um, when, we, when we got it back from, from our first pharmaceutical commercial partner. All of that led us to kind of this deeper vision and desire of what else could we do uh, to, to help um, improve the lives of patients and to help fix some of the brokenness, some of the inefficiencies in healthcare. So, um, I left that company a few years ago, and uh, Dr. Gupton has been a friend, colleague, and mentor uh, for, for many years. We met in the parking lot one day. He's like, you need to see what we're doing. I knew a little bit about Medicines for All, but started to get to know a little bit more about the great work they had been doing in the developing world, especially for HIV, TB, and malaria, and started thinking through how can we apply this technology domestically that led to conversations and it led to us also talking about uh, just how bad drug shortages were in the United States of America. Uh, and then the idea for flow was born and things just started taking off, especially when COVID uh, hit. Absolutely. You know, as somebody who suffers from um, severe uh, tree nut allergies, it's, it's amazing when I heard, you know, your kind of introduction to this 
And um, uh, having to use an EpiPen once before, I completely appreciate, you know, what you were uh, solving for there. It's, it's, it's a, no pun intended, and it's a jarring experience. So, <laughs> and I too met uh, Frank Gupton in a parking lot. So for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess we all should stop hanging around at Home Depot. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Gupton, I have a question for you about Medicines for All. So tell us about how this idea originally came about and what inspired you to actually focus on that particular area of research. You know, it's funny you mention that, Jay, because I think that one of the reasons why it, it, it drew me to this area was I have kind of an unusual background with regards to uh, the chemical sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. I started out my career in commodity chemicals where margins were tight and pennies made a difference. And that got drilled into me early on uh, as far as how to develop a process that looks efficient and can be run uh, with a minimal amount of labor cost. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, the... I evolved my career, uh, my career evolved into ag uh, chemicals and ag agricultural intermediates, and then uh, uh, eventually pharmaceutical intermediates and, and active ingredients for pharma products. But I never forgot about this issue about cost. And so um, when you start looking at what we're doing, we're making technical decisions on where to focus our research efforts based on cost drivers in the molecule. And, and whether it's working with the Gates Foundation or working with Flow or other entities, that's kind of the uniqueness of the model that we have. The other thing I'll say is that my research groups were typically, when I was in industry, were a 50-50 mix of chemists and chemical engineers. And when you start looking at uh, the problems here, they're kind of right at the interface between those two disciplines. So my research group in academia is I have PhD students in the chemistry department, and PhD students in the chemical engineering department that are working side by side to solve problems and they cross train each other. And they work together to try and solve these problems based on their collective knowledge of those two disciplines. And so that's, it's a pretty unique uh, academic model for educating our scientists and engineers of the 21st century. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Edwards, I have a question about flow. This is fascinating to me, the whole concept. Um, and I know that you two had a, um, founded this together, but tell us about how that idea in, it was, was generated and then the struggles to found something like flow uh, in today's environment. So uh, when, when Frank and I got together, our original vision and mission was all aligned around this broken pharmaceutical supply chain that had resulted in drug shortages uh, impacting some of our most vulnerable patient populations, uh, in particular, um, children, our pediatric patients. Children's hospitals today scramble. They scramble to try to find basic essential medicines needed to care uh, for children that are in critical care environments, in the emergency room, um, there are drug shortages on our ambulance. When you call 911 today, there will be a drug shortage in that drug box of a basic essential medicine um, that has been perpetual. And these drug shortages have plagued our country for years. And Frank and I saw an opportunity to apply his platform and technology to try to go after some of the root causes that have led to drug shortages, beginning with um, inefficiencies in our manufacturing, not, um, not really finding the best processes to make these active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, so leveraging continuous flow chemistry, leveraging advanced manufacturing technology to help improve efficiency, drive down the cost, uh, improve environmental sustainability. A lot of that had not been applied to the pharmaceutical sector, especially with these key generic essential medicines. So we saw an opportunity to work together on that. We also met some uh, fantastic, I would say, um, innovators who were working in like manner to make change with the essential medicine arena, including Dr. Uh, Martin Van Trieste, who's the ch former chief quality officer of um, Amgen. So Martin Van Trieste, the former chief quality of, uh, officer of Amgen, became the CEO of Civica, 
And we've been working with Civica as the largest nonprofit pharma company to solve this challenge together. Frank uh, introduced me to Dr. Marshall Summer, who's at Children's National Hospital, to talk about the real challenges around pediatric drug shortages. So we just started talking around what could we do to improve the efficiencies in the supply chain? What could we learn and borrow from other business models, such as the one that Civica incorporates? And then how can we add additional teaming partners, including Ampac Fine Chemicals that has the old facility that Frank used to help run, um, including process development? How could we build a teaming relationship and partnership to help solve for these real drug shortage challenges? We had had all of that working behind the scenes before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, uh, and we were about to stand up this children's hospital partnership, we saw that a lot of these drugs overlapped with the key critical essential medicines that were already in shortage, but were going to be utilized for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. That's when uh, Frank and I kind of sounded the alarm bell. We worked with people who had been tackling this problem of our over-reliance on foreign supply chains, including Rosemary Gibson, who wrote the book, China Rx. We started having conversations with um, government, White House, HHS, National Security Council, FDA, whoever would listen. We were sounding the alarm bells of don't just focus on PPE and ventilators. We're going to run out of the basic medicines you need to intubate a patient to get them on a ventilator. And we need to do something rapidly now from a surge response to, to make sure we protect these essential medicines. And we need to do something long-term to bring this critical infrastructure end to end back to the United States of America. So that's how all of this evolved from this initial small idea of let's tackle the pediatric drug shortages to let's play a prominent role as a thought leader to solve for essential medicine shortages during COVID and partner with the United States government and a huge contract to reshore this critical industrial base for the benefit of all Americans in the future as a matter of national public health security. And it is that long-term benefit, which I think is so exciting. And uh, it has really attracted the attention of not only people here in the Commonwealth, but across the country and throughout the federal government of what kind of dynamic impact this can make uh, for the country. So that's, I think, what is absolutely uh, amazing about this. So talk about the partnership between Medicines for All and then Flow, and how is that progressing short-term, long-term? Frank, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So we're basically taking those ba those principles that we, we learned and applied to these global health drugs and uh, are using them on uh, an essential medicines list that uh, Eric and I actually helped develop <laughs> over the years with, the, uh, with overlap between the FDA, HHS, and the Department of Defense. And so we prioritized the, the, the drug list, and then we, we identified our first five drugs that we were going after. And we will wrap up our first drug transfer this month, and the second drug will come out next month. And that'll be then transferred for scale up while Eric's building the facility down in Petersburg. So it's kind of like uh, we're uh, running the train down the track while we're building the railroad. And, right. but, but it's but it's uh, it's actually working. And I think that we're, you know, that when you start looking at the economics of the processes, you know, the whole goal of this is to at least be equivalent in cost to our uh, uh, overseas uh, competitors. And so and, and hopefully we'll be below cost. But the strategy, from my perspective, uh, Jay, is, you know, we think about it. Uh, some people may perceive this as a make or buy situation. I see it as a make and buy situation mm -hmm. because what we anticipate is the prices will come down for overseas manufacturers when flow enters the market, but it's because flow is entering the market that the prices are coming down. So the point being is that it should be a make and buy strategy so that we will always have a domestic source, but we could, uh, uh, we could purchase uh, drugs uh, from foreign sources opportunistically when it's appropriate. But to have that capability is, is kind of the, the driving force behind not only accessibility, but uh, the cost of goods. So wow. these are two things that we feel like are going to really add value to that process. 
And I'll just add, you know, from a short-term vision, we started with rapid response for COVID, getting um, partnering with Civica and others who already have manufacturing capabilities to deliver over 2 million doses of critical essential medicines into the strategic national stockpile. Now, as Frank mentioned, it's this end-to-end -end infrastructure that we're building in partnership with Medicines for All, where we will become one of the most well-equipped continuous R&D labs in the country um, we have partnerships, um, not only between Medicines for All and Flow, and we're trying to strengthen those and grow those partnership, uh, that partnership, but we're also partnering with USP, who's bringing their own labs next to us and, and having to looking for creative ways where, candidly, we can reinstill confidence and trust into our pharmaceutical supply chain, build these processes here. What we're really doing is we're deconstructing these molecules where the chemistry hasn't been looked at for, in some cases, 40 to 50 years. And then we're reconstructing them for efficiency, for cost effectiveness, to reduce our environmental footprint. And we're gonna be doing that and growing that over time uh, for these critical essential medicines as a matter of supply chain resiliency and redundancy. Uh, and so that we can, as Frank mentioned, be competitive. And the only way to do that is have the right public-private partnerships. And we've been fortunate to land this massive government contract that's subsidizing our initial programs, our people, our processes, and importantly, connected to VCU workforce development so that we can make sure we have the talent for the future right here, filling our manufacturing facilities. And is this happening anywhere else in the country, or is this truly unique to uh, the Commonwealth and then VCU right now? It's first of its kind. So when we're talking about an integrated end-to-end -end manufacturing uh, partnership that first and for foremost involves advanced manufacturing technology. So continuous manufacturing, as Frank will tell you, has been utilized uh, primarily with innovative biopharmaceutical products and some other uh, pharmaceuticals, but has not been widely applied in general to the pharmaceutical industry, but especially for the generics, because it, it, it requires a significant amount of capital expenditure, the right facilities, the right talent, the right expertise. Uh, the FDA doesn't have a ton of experience yet uh, working for many of these drug processes that, that are leveraging continuous technology and flow chemistry. That's why we applied for and were accepted to the FDA's emerging technology program. And so we're working alongside the FDA uh, but the first of its kind to actually be able to make these chemicals, design them, manufacture the active ingredient, and then have the capability to get them into a finished dosage form, all within a concentrated uh, region for the benefit of our country, that does not exist like it does uh, with the FLOW program. Frank, anything to add to that? Yeah, I do, Eric. And I think that uh, he did a great job of describing what, it, what the objective is. But I think the other thing that's really important is for people to understand that we're making drugs that nobody will make because they, they can't afford to make them. They have a choice of making a drug that has a very low or no margin in their facilities or something that actually can act, uh, be profitable for them. And that's one of the reasons why we created, the, the short, shortage was created. So by reinventing these processes and making them more cost-effective, it makes more sense to produce them in our platforms that rather than uh, being produced in a tr traditional way with other pharma companies. So I, I, I say often, Frank, and he'll appreciate this, when, when, we, when I talk to um, my, my kids or, or family members and they say, so, so what does Flow do? I'll, I'll say, Flow is working on all the medicines that other companies left behind to serve the populations that no one else would ever serve. Wow. Great, well said. So what is right now the, the most important priority for the entire pharmaceutical industry? And then what is the most important uh, effort for pharmaceutical education today? So first about the industry, what's the biggest priority then for the industry? Well, I think that's a, obviously a big question that can go in several directions. I think the industry right now is uh, facing a lot of um, headwinds um, when you have to demonstrate more and more value in the products that you're producing. Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, I, on Capitol Hill, for example, on drug pricing and the lack of transparency. Ironically, uh, when you look at the medicines that we're producing at Flow, 
Uh, the opposite problem is the case. The, the, the pricing for these drugs have been driven so low, they haven't been sustainable. They actually need to raise the pricing. When a bottle of water costs more than a life-saving dose uh, of, of medicine or life-saving vial, um, uh, you should really start looking at the economics. So we're, we're having those conversations around drug pricing doesn't it impact all drugs the same way. Um, but I think the industry is really moving in a direction that involves three components. First and foremost, what, what do we do in the future to articulate a strong value proposition for the medicines that we're producing, right? The second is, what do our supply chains because of COVID look like? And do we need to change the way we think about delivering drugs to our customers? And obviously, Flo is playing a, a major role in looking at the supply chain chain holistically for these essential medicines, a particular class of drugs. Essential medicines are de defined as the priority medicines necessary to sustain the health of a population. And then the third piece goes into this manufacturing technology. I think we're moving towards the recognition that the uh, America needs to play a leading role, a leadership role in taking the world into an advanced manufacturing arena. Uh, and that involves a lot of the great work that Dr. Gupton started years ago. And this contract with the government, this public-private partnership is going to catalyze additional activity to make advanced manufacturing real for the industry. So if flow is successful and, and when we're successful, moving these processes and building these drugs, leveraging continuous manufacturing technology, I think it's going to catalyze additional activity for other manufacturing partners that will have great benefits for society above and beyond uh, efficient processes. We're talking about reducing our environmental footprint and our carbon emissions. We're talking about looking at different models, such as a B Corp model, an impact-driven model uh, that can show that a pharma company can do good and do well at the same time. And so we're excited about being a part of those trends. Frank, on the education side or anything to add there? Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think one of the things that we really have an opportunity for uh, is um, to look at how the educational process can be reimagined to be able to position our students and our graduates to be able to not only make an impact in the work that we're doing, but to become leaders in big pharma once they transfer out of our, our organizations so that they can, they can look at a process more holistically than just as a chemist or just as an engineer. And I think that this is where we really have an opportunity to uh, make a huge impact, Jay. Here's what I will say is our students usually have multiple, our, our graduate students in our program, whether they're chemical engineers or chemists, have multiple offers long before they are starting to write their theses. And, and what that speaks to is the fact that there's this huge unmet need out there for for, for our whole educational process to, to be rethought. Because if, if, you know, if we're still teaching using you know, early 20th century pedagogy, we're really not preparing the students for the challenges of the 21st century. And I tell our students in the lab all the time, I said, look, your goal in our lab is to make new mistakes, not old mistakes. I said, I made those mistakes years ago. And my job is to transfer that knowledge to you to be able to tell you what not to do so that you can make new mistakes and start pushing the envelope. And I think that's what we should all be doing. You know, I will say, Jay, just to tag on to the education piece, it is really important that we can have access to highly technical talent to, and, and be able to partner to build this infrastructure that is very advanced. Being able to have the federal government helping to actually provide workforce development dollars as a part of this contract that's enabling us to partner with VCU and Medicines for All to help get students and graduate students into the lab that then will become the workforce of the future at Flow's facilities is a very, very exciting program. And what's also really exciting is when Frank and his team and others at VCU decide, let's do something that no one else has done before with creating programs such as the Pharmaceutical Engineering PhD program. These are the types of things that we look forward to uh, in the future as we think about the intersection of education and industry. So in, in terms of COVID-19 COVID and the impact, how does it impact these priorities, both in the, for the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical education, 
and then things that you're trying to do for the Medicines for All Institute and Flow as well. You want to take that one, Eric? I'll start and just say that for Flow, the good news is, and Frank will appreciate this uh, based off of our ex insane experience last year uh, within government and getting this contract, this contract is, is considered critical infrastructure. We are working on the essential medicines while, while there's so much attention with the vaccines and boosters and infrastructure for vaccines and all of these things, there's equal attention now that is on this supply chain for critical essential medicines, the basic medicines that we need to sustain the health of a population. So because it is critical, we haven't had uh, as severe an impact um, with COVID as others. In fact, we've had things accelerate uh, faster. We've been able to navigate COVID well, both with um, it's sustaining our workforce and growing our workforce during COVID. In fact, um, we're so blessed and fortunate. We every time we put a new job description out there, we have, you know, in in many cases over a hundred apply very quickly. So we're getting we're we're able to choose this because really a mission driven workforce who are tired of big pharma or tired of the circumstances that they've had and they want to work on something that's new that's changing the entire supply chain for the entire industry uh, and they're excited about working here. I will say that we do have to navigate the challenges that COVID have brought forth as it relates to supply chain and infrastructure and, and uh, getting the right building supplies. We've had to rework our infrastructure to make sure we stay on time, on task, on budget. And those are challenges that everyone is dealing with. Uh, but, but most of all, uh, we've been able to stay on task with our priorities. And I think an example of that was shown last year out of 3,500 companies Flow was given the small uh, contractor of small business contractor of the year award by the Department of Health and Human Services. So that just shows that we've been able to execute uh, during COVID, and we're executing to help support the COVID um, response plan as, as well. Um, Frank, you want to comment on the educational environment during COVID, and because I, I do think that is unique with with the labs and the students, et cetera. Okay, you're right, Eric. Uh, a couple of things, yeah, you, know, you know, I think that are really important to point out too is one of the, uh, from, a, from a, a knowledge perspective, we've been able to come up on the learning curve relatively quickly because uh, of the partnerships we've been able to, to uh, um, forge over the, over the relatively short period of time. And when you think about, you know, Civic uh, Rx, their mission is to be a, a very, uh, strategic supplier to all the major hospitals in the United States. Okay. Now, when you think about that, think about the normal supply chain that is currently in the United States. From the time a drug leaves a pharmaceutical company to when it gets to the consumer, it probably changes hands several times. And each of those, those transactional activities isn't pro you know, probably creating as much value as making the drug itself but everybody takes a profit along the way. And when you start looking at what, what Civic has done, they're directly supplying to the end user, the hospitals. And so you've, you've greatly simplified the supply chain. And that's what we're hoping to be able to achieve on a much broader scale uh, across a lot of different um, markets. Now, uh, the, the Civica folks brought us on board very quickly and showed us how that, that could be applied in the systems we're looking at. But then, when we start looking at the educational aspect of what we're doing with the students, they're not only looking at making the drugs, but they're seeing how their cost-effective uh, uh, improvements that are made in these processes directly translate into commercialization activities in the marketplace, which is something that's very unique to um, academia in that, you know, usually somebody who's doing research in a lab the exception of the rule is when something gets commercialized. With us, virtually, virtually everything that we do is going to get commercialized, which is really uh, a quite different paradigm for how you train people. For the you mean actually, actually having science translated? <laughs> there you go. A figure, right? No, it is great. It's a great point. It is so interesting to think about the career opportunities and quite honestly, the, the entire professional uh, opportunity for students coming out of uh, Frank's program and others, uh, a complete paradigm shift uh, where you can have an impact that touches every aspect 
of uh, someone's life. A pharmaceutical um, transformation is just, the implications are amazing. It's amazing what you guys have accomplished today. Um, we are so happy that uh, VCU could be part of this and, and uh, help you along the journey. And uh, we absolutely look forward to seeing where this all goes. Uh, one of the things that I love to end these with is just to uh, kind of find out something unique about each of you. And so I want to ask you, tell us about something about yourself that might surprise people, something that people might not know about each one of you. So, Frank, I'm going to start with you. OK, so, um, uh, Jay, I guess my second job is is, is as uh, a contractor for housing. My wife and I have built uh, five houses together. And, <laughs> and what I will say is that um, um, it, it, it will either strengthen a marriage or break it very quickly. And, and uh, uh, my wife is a very creative lady. She enjoys partnering with me on these things. But we've done everything from building uh, five houses from the ground up to uh, 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 building a, a, a 20 by 40 in-ground swimming pool on my own. Wow. Uh, and so it was, it, it, I think uh, the motto uh, in the family is, I'll try, I'll try anything once. <laughs> and then once <laughs> I figure out that it's not fun doing, I'll stop doing it. I, I don't know where you get second job, Frank. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I continue <laughs> to count like fourth, fifth or sixth job, but uh that's amazing. Um, I, I guess one that one that most people may not know is uh, even today, after getting my um, medical doctor degree, I, I still ride on an ambulance two to three times per month. I still volunteer um, with uh, my original volunteer rescue squad that I started riding when I was 17 years old, training paramedic. Wow. And, uh, getting close to the patient. And, uh, and I guess one other that's related to that, um, I had delivered like 20 something children before I was uh, 20, 20 something babies before um, I was uh, 23 years old. And, um, and that includes, uh, even though my wife did most of the work, I did help deliver my first child. So. Wow. <laughs> well, that, that those are those are remarkable things. And uh, I'm with you, Eric. I, I don't know uh, how Frank finds some of this time to do the, these kind of projects. And um, you two are some of the hardest working people I know in the city of Richmond. So I really want to thank you for your time today. I know that you are busy individuals, but I knew that um, the VCU community in the greater Richmond area would love to learn more about what's happening with Medicines for All and Flow. So thank you all for joining me today. Thank you thank very much, Jay. Thank you all.